So a fairly prominent atheist YouTuber named Rationality Rules recently released a video entitled Ben Shapiro Calmly Educated by Stephen Woodford. And in the thumbnail, Shapiro's unactualized actualizer destroyed. Now naturally such a video would attract my attention, and perhaps the same is true for my audience. So let's watch this video together and see what we can learn. Love him or loathe him, I'm sure you'll agree with me when I say that Ben Shapiro is one of the greatest debaters around. He's intelligent, quick-witted, excellent at avoiding distractions, is amply armed with references, and, of course, he wields some fantastic one-liners. When you make a substance illegal, the people who are criminals were criminals before, and they're criminals after. Al Capone was not going to turn into a banker after Prohibition ended. Let me ask you this. How, uh, okay, I won't ask you how old... I will ask you how old you are, okay? Because you're young enough that it's probably not insulting to ask you. So... I'm 22, so I'm probably only naive, right? No. Why aren't you 60? Why aren't you 60? <laughs> and yet, despite Ben's prowess, I disagree with him on almost every major issue. Sure, I'm with him when he's dispensing unrehearsed emotional college students who embody the regressive left. I'm not denying your humanity if you're a transgender person. I am saying that you are not the sex to which you claim to be. But on most topics, such as politics, abortion, and free will, I'm fervently against him. Now, I should point out that my attention isn't primarily going to be directed at Ben Shapiro. Rather, it's going to be directed at the philosophical argumentation in this video, particularly that of St. Thomas and Aristotle. Although, I insist on watching the full video, just for the sake of completeness. But I can always understand where he's coming from. While I reject many of his assertions, such as morality requiring free will, If you don't have the capacity to choose, how do you have moral responsibility? He rarely commits a logical fallacy. That is, unless he's arguing for religion. On this topic, I find him staggering before. In fact, the reason I haven't addressed his religious arguments before is because I consider them low-hanging fruit. In my, and many other people's opinion, religion is Ben's soft underbelly, and over the next few months I'm going to do my best to illuminate this. This is Ben Shapiro, calmly educated by Stephen Woodford. <laughs> Come on, if one's going to create a Ben Shapiro video, one must follow the Ben Shapiro YouTube title guidelines, right? So today's Sunday special featuring Sam Harris, the author of Waking Up and the host of the Waking Up podcast will begin in just a second. First, I want to remind you that you're going to die. <laughs> How do you do your job in a politically correct universe? But first, I want to say thanks to our sponsors over at Lending Club. So aside from talking about all this uplifting stuff, let's talk about your death. Okay, so life insurance is pretty important. <laughs> ben, dude, I appreciate that your business requires adverts, but can't you pre-record them or something? I mean, they are so invasive. But talking about invasive adverts, Debunked is a highly strategic card game that's now on Kickstarter. <laughs> Jokes aside, it really is on Kickstarter. The aim of the game is to debunk fallacious arguments while preventing your opponents from doing the same, by, say, stealing or discarding their cards. It's genuinely really fun to play, and my hope is that you like it enough to back the idea on Kickstarter. The arguments are real, and so too are the fallacies that they commit. And so, not only is this game thoroughly enjoyable, it's also a fantastic learning tool. And so, please do check out the Kickstarter. I'd really appreciate it. Anyhow, back on track. When asked to justify the existence of his god, Ben predominantly relies on two arguments. That being the argument from sufficient reason. One is, the, is based on the principle of sufficient reason, this idea that we have the capacity to understand the universe. And the other, and most prominent, is Thomas Aquinas' rendition of Aristotle's Unmove Mover. And it's this argument that I'm going to respond to within this video, as given away by the thumbnail. So I'm going to make now an Aristotelian slash Aquinas argument uh, for, for the existence of God. So the basic uh, idea, and I'm going to try and boil this down so that it makes some sense. Uh, the basic Aristotelian argument for the existence of an unmoved mover is the idea that there are a bunch of, every object around you has actual and potential, right? It has, it has an actuality and it has a potential. So if you have a candle and it's made of wax, it has the potential to be a pool of wax, but that potential is not fulfilled unless something acts upon it. The only thing that can act upon an object and make it fulfill its potential is either another object that has its own potential or something that is pure actuality, right? It does not have any potential. It's just actual. It just exists, right? So the idea, the, the idea in the Aristotelian argument for God is that if you don't want an infinite, infinite regress of causes, if you don't want an infinite regress of things that have actuality and potential and then something has to actualize it and something has to actualize it and something has to actualize it, you have to come to the unactualized actualizer, right? A thing that just is, 
right? A thing that just exists. And as Aquinas says, this is what we call God, right? This thing that exists and has the capacity to actualize the potential of other objects. And so this is his argument for the existence of God, that otherwise you get an infinite regress and there, there need not be an infinite regress of causes. Now Shapiro's exposition of the argument from motion, or the argument from change as I call it, isn't absolutely terrible. But the issue is, he's working off the cuff, he's working from memory, and when one does that, there are going to be a number of concepts that one's going to forget, or a number of key aspects of the argument one is going to leave out, and Shapiro does precisely that. For example, he doesn't talk about the basis of the argument in the real world, or real experience of change, or motion. He doesn't talk about the sort of causation which is pertinent to the argument, which is a series ordered essentially, or hierarchically, as Phaser puts it, as opposed to a causal series ordered accidentally, or peracidens. And he also doesn't talk about how it makes no sense, and it's impossible to have a series of essentially ordered actualizers and things actualized, which regresses indefinitely, or infinitely, as he puts it. This conclusion has nothing to do with what one wants, or what one likes. It is also not a hypothesis. It is not an arbitrary stipulation. It's not even an axiom in the modern sense of that term. It's a deduction from premises, and someone such as myself would contend that it's true whether you want it to be or not. You'll see Phaser develop some of these points in his little blurb, but same thing applies. One cannot do philosophy in these blurbs. One must read a text, which Phaser does provide. He wrote a whole book on this topic. And so if one is serious, one must read the text. This is philosophy, not politics. We don't do serious work in blurbs or off-the-cuff statements. So there's Ben's explanation of the argument. But before giving any objections, I want to bolster it via Edward Fazer, who is a philosopher that Ben both endorses and often defers to. If you want to read a good book about proofs of God, uh, then Edward Fazer is a book I've recommended on the show. Basically, the Aristotelian argument starts from the fact that change occurs, right? So, you know, the, the water in the cup here started out being really cold when it came from the fridge, and now it's kind of lukewarm, right? That would be an example of change, or I move my hand through space and so forth, that's an example of change. Aristotle argues that on analysis, change always involves the actualization of a potential, something going from potential to actual. My hand's potentially over there, now it's actually over there. Water's potentially lukewarm, then it becomes actually lukewarm. Whenever something goes from potential to actual, there's always something already actual that makes that happen. And if that already actual thing goes from potential to actual, there's something already actual making that happen. So we've got one thing being changed by another being changed by another, or one thing being actualized by another being actualized by another, and so forth. And Aristotle concludes that we would have a vicious regress if there weren't something at the bottom level, you might say, that actualizes everything else without having to be actualized, because it's already, as he puts it, purely actual. It's moving other things or changing other things without itself being moved or changed. It's a, what I call in the book, a purely actual actualizer or an unchanging changer or an unmoving mover. Now, you may have noticed there were some jump cuts there, and so I'd like to play his full response to that question, because there were some things that were cut out there which Phaser notes are crucial to the argument, and without which one cannot understand the argument or understand the inferences. So, so, so your book is Five Proofs of the Existence of God, and I want to go through some of them with you, because I think yeah. that, you know, like, as you say, most people, when they think about God, they think about, you know, whatever their parents told them about when they were kids, and they haven't really taken a serious look at, okay, why would people think God exists other than my parents think God exists and I like beautiful sunsets? So what is the actual philosophical grounding for the idea that there might, in fact, be a God? So which of these proofs is your favorite? And if you could explicate it for us, that'd be, that'd be great. Yeah, probably my favorite is the first one in the book, which I label the Aristotelian proof. And as you can guess from that label, it goes back to Aristotle. And it is important to emphasize, as I do in the book, none of these arguments I put forward in the book are new. They're not original with me. The formulations I give, the way I present them might be, uh, might be novel. But the basic idea, the basic nerve of each proof goes back, in, in most cases, centuries, even millennia. Case of Aristotle's argument, at least 2,300 years, if not more, because you even see an earlier version of that in Plato. So if you want me to present you know, yeah, a, little, a, a simplified version of the argument. So basically, the Aristotelian argument starts from the fact that change occurs, right? So you know, the, the water in the cup here started out being really cold when it came from the fridge, and now it's kind of lukewarm, right? That would be an example of change, or I move my hand through space and so forth. That's an example of change. Aristotle argues that on analysis, change always involves the actualization of a potential, something going from potential to actual. My hand's potentially over there, now it's actually over there. Water's potentially lukewarm, then it becomes actually lukewarm. And he develops this idea in response to a couple uh, ancient Greek philosophers named Parmenides and Zeno, who denied that change was possible. So he presents this argument of what change is as a way to answer them. 
But it also forms the starting point of his argument for, for God, for what he calls an unmoved mover, the prime unmoved mover of the world. Because the idea is that, well, if change involves going from potential to actual, we have to ask, how does that ever happen? And his answer is that something can go from potential to actual only if there's already something there that's actual that makes that happen. So to make that a little more concrete, my hand's actually right here. It's potentially to the left, right? And for, that, for it actually to become to the left, right, there has to be something already actual that makes that happen. The firing of the nerves in my nervous system that causes the muscles to flex. So Aristotle proceeds to the conclusion that, well, whenever something goes from potential to actual, there's always something already actual that makes that happen. And if that already actual thing goes from potential to actual, there's something already actual making that happen. So we've got one thing being changed by another being changed by another, or one thing being actualized by another being actualized by another, and so forth. And, crucial step in this argument, the most fundamental way in which this is true for Aristotle has to do with a series of changers or causes that extend not backward in time into the past, but downward here and now, you might say. So my hand moves here and now because the motor neurons are firing here and now. And those motor neurons are firing here and now because there are other neurons firing here and now. And that's only possible because my nervous system is held in place, you might say, by its molecular structure and so forth. So we have one level of reality here and now actualized by another, actualized by another. And Aristotle concludes that we would have a vicious regress if there weren't something at the bottom level, you might say, that actualizes everything else without having to be actualized because it's already, as he puts it, purely actual. It's moving other things or changing other things without itself being moved or changed. It's a, what I call in the book, a purely actual actualizer or an unchanging changer or an unmoving mover. And if there weren't such a thing operating here and now, not, not just something that knocks down the first domino back at the Big Bang, but here and now, then there wouldn't be change going on here and now. That's the basic idea of the argument. Or an uncaused cause or a non-contingent contingency, etc. It's pretty much all the same. Well, no, it's not pretty much all the same. Each one of those is a technical term. Motion, cause, contingent. And you'll see when you unpack the definition of the term contingent, that it makes no sense for a being to be a non-contingent contingency. Now, Fazer's rendition of this argument is composed of 49 premises. Yeah, I'm serious, 49. But Aquinas's was much more in line with most arguments, being four. Now, truth be told, I'm torn between whose rendition to primarily address, as Ben more often references Aquinas than he does Phaser, but the latter evidently takes every opportunity he can to accuse atheists of not understanding the arguments that he upholds. And then you encounter skeptical writers like Nietzsche or David Hume or Bertrand Russell or someone like that, you're very impressed by that because you hadn't heard it before. You didn't realize there were people who were presenting these objections. So you're very impressed by it. You're usually a teenager anyway, so you're open to hearing the language of rebellion. A lot of the objections that were trotted out, I realized, were aimed at caricatures. They were aimed at straw men. They weren't really attacking what Aquinas or Leibniz or whoever had actually said. On this note, the esteemed biologist Jerry Coyne wrote an excellent rebuttal to Phaser, and correctly predicted his reply by writing, His response will consist in noting my failure to have spent half my lifetime studying the works of Aquinas and Phaser. Indeed, this is the same trick that many Muslims employ when they insist that unless you've read the whole of the Quran in Arabic, you can't possibly dismiss its divinity. You know, Einstein put it best, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. As did John Adams when he said, mystery, and in this case a billion premises, is a convenient excuse for absurdity. If one is genuinely interested in the truth, it should not matter how long an argument is. And it especially should not matter, given Phaser spent the entire chapter, the Aristotelian proof chapter in Five Proofs of the Existence of God, going through each line, giving examples and laying out the definitions, and starting from the basics, and explaining all this stuff. And even within the 50 lines of the argument, only 14 have to do with the conclusion to the unactualized actualizer, so it's not even that long. The rest of the argument is spelling out the attributes of this unactualized actualizer, because it's often said that one cannot reason any further from the unactualized actualizer. For example, one cannot prove that there must be only one unactualized actualizer, or that this unactualized actualizer has intellect, or will, or can be said to be perfect, or good, or eternal. All of this is shown to be false in the argument. And this whole argument is preempted by an entire chapter of text, which goes through the argument, again, going through the basic concepts, and responding to objections and misconceptions of the argument. If one truly wants to hear an argument, and if one is truly willing to listen and be open-minded, then this should be no problem. But if one is none of the above, please don't give the pretense of being that if you're not willing to listen to the argument or read what the other side has to say. 
And there is plenty of evidence of people misunderstanding these arguments, and I give some of this evidence in part one of my series on classical theology, as does Phaser throughout his book. For example, one common misunderstanding is believing that the premise, everything is emotion, is actually a premise to the argument, when it is not, if you actually take the time to read the argument, and therefore thinking that the objection who made God is a serious objection to the argument. Another misconception is believing that the arguments are wrong because they don't prove Christianity, whereas the argument doesn't actually argue for that. And another misconception is believing that the argument is seriously rebutted by saying that perhaps the universe would be eternal. But there is no premise in the argument which requires that the universe is finite in duration, or had a beginning in the past. And therefore, considerations about the Big Bang are just totally irrelevant to these arguments, particularly the argument from motion. Whereas, as Phaser points out, the argument from change, the Aristotelian proof, has to do with actualization in the present, here and now, not just in the distant past. There's no trick here, this is just all part of understanding what the argument even is. Anyhow, I'm going to focus primarily on Aquinas' rendition, but I'll simultaneously touch upon phases. So here's Aquinas' rendition, as translated by the fathers of the English Dominican province. Premise 1. It is certain, and evident to our senses, that in the world, some things are in motion. If you have a candle and it's made of wax, it has the potential to be a pool of wax. Basically, the Aristotelian argument starts from the fact that change occurs. This premise I of course accept. Things change. Premise 2. Now whatever is in motion is put in motion by another, for nothing can be in motion except it is in potentiality to that towards which it is in motion, whereas a thing moves inasmuch as it is in act, for motion is nothing else than the reduction of something from potentiality to actuality. But nothing can be reduced from potentiality to actuality except by something in a state of actuality. Thus, that which is actually hot, as fire makes wood, which is potentially hot, to be actually hot, and thereby moves and changes it. The only thing that can act upon an object and make it fulfill its potential is either another object that has its own potential, or something that is pure actuality. If you have a candle and it's made of wax, it has the potential to be a pool of wax, but that potential is not fulfilled unless something acts upon it. On analysis, change always involves the actualization of a potential, something going from potential to actual. Whenever something goes from potential to actual, there's always something already actual that makes that happen. The water in the cup here started out being really cold when it came from the fridge, and now it's kind of lukewarm. Now I'm happy to tentatively accept this premise. Phaser had the potential to make a four-premise argument 49, and then he actually made a four-premise argument 49. But the reason I say tentatively is because, sure, everything we've observed appears to adhere to the principle of causation. That is, everything that's actual appears to have been actualized by a prior actualizer. But since we've only observed a tiny fragment of the universe, and since we're yet to discover the theory of everything, that is, a coherent theoretical framework that fully explains and links all aspects of the universe, we can't honestly assert that everything adheres to the principle of causation, lest we want to commit a black swan fallacy. And so yes, I accept this premise, but only under the rubric of ignorance. No, that's not the argument. The argument is not everything that I have seen in my limited experience that has gone from potential to actual, that has changed, was actualized by another, or it's due to another actuality. Therefore, everything that goes from potential to actual is due to another actuality. That isn't the argument. The argument is a deduction from the nature of actuality and potentiality. Only something that is in act, that is actual, can do something. Something that is in potentiality, such as the potential lukewarmness of the water in Phaser's example, can't do anything, being only potential. Only something actual can do something, can cause something or actualize another. And there must be something else other than what is actualized, because something cannot be both actually and potentially in the very same way, in the very same respect. For it would have to be and not be in the very same respect, which is just preposterous nonsense. Therefore, the actuality responsible for the actualization of the potential must be another actuality. That is deduction, not some sort of human induction done from a preponderance of cases just seeing the same thing over and over again. That's not the argument. And Phaser talks about this the third page of the Aristotelian proof chapter, which would be chapter 19. St. Thomas points this out in the argument. But nothing can be reduced from potentiality to actuality except by something in a state of actuality. Thus, that which is actually hot, as fire, makes wood, which is potentially hot, to be actually hot, and thereby moves and changes it. Now, it is not possible that the same thing should be at once in actuality and potentiality in the same respect, but only in different respects. But what is actually hot cannot simultaneously be potentially hot, but is simultaneously potentially cold. It is therefore impossible that in the same respect, 
And in the same way, a thing should be both mover and moved. That is, that it should move itself. Therefore, whatever is in motion must be put in motion by another. Also, whether the gentleman here is ignorant of the truth of the premise is irrelevant to its truth. The question here is whether the premise is true or whether it is not true. It's one or the other. Is it true or is it false? The comment about the theory of everything is simply irrelevant. Nothing in that reasoning relied upon the premise that one has a theory of everything. It's just a red herring. But here's the thing, and here's what's funny. The proponents of Aquinas' unmoved mover don't accept this premise, even tentatively. While they insist that whenever something goes from potential to actual, there's always, always, always something already actual that makes that happen. They make a special exception, or commit a special pleading fallacy, for their god. They insist that their god had the potential to create the universe, that it then actually created the universe, but that it did so without something actualizing it. No, we accept the premise fully. Creation is a technical term, and creation does not imply either a change in god, or a change in a previously existing substance, rather the full production of a substance with nothing presupposed. Creation is not a change, and not being a change, it can't therefore contradict the premise, since the premise says whatever is changed is changed by another, and since we're not even talking about a change, it cannot conceivably contradict the premise. And so what the gentleman says here about creation being some actualization of a potential in God is simply a straw man. It seems that he hasn't bothered to look up what that term creation means when his opponents use it. Either this, or they insist that their god doesn't have any potential to be actualized. It does not have any potential, it's just actual, it just exists. And yes, we do insist that god has no potentialities awaiting actualization, because that's just the conclusion of the argument. That's just where reason takes us. We argue from the reality of change in the world, to something which has no potentialities whatsoever, that which is purely actual. But in which case, it follows, according to their logic, that it cannot actualize anything. Because, on analysis, change always, always, always involves the actualization of a potential. No, it doesn't follow. It's not true that whatever actualizes is itself actualized. He doesn't know that. And in fact, the argument claims that that must be false. The gentleman here is utterly confused being actualized, or being changed, in the passive sense, with changing, or actualizing, in the active sense. Those two are not the same. But it does follow that whatever is an unactualized actualizer is itself immutable is without change. But it does not follow from that that this cannot actively change, that is, actualize another. For being completely actual, it is the most equipped, the most powerful, to actively change, though it itself cannot be changed passively. Anyhow, moving on, premise three. Now it is not possible that the same thing should be at once in actuality and potentiality in the same respect, but only in different respects. For what is actually hot cannot simultaneously be potentially hot but it is simultaneously potentially cold. It is therefore impossible that in the same respect and in the same way a thing should be both mover and moved, i.e. that it should move itself. Therefore, whatever is in motion must be put in motion by another. If that by which it is put in motion be itself put in motion, then this also must need to be put in motion by another, and then by another again. Now there's a fair amount of confusion around this premise, and it's generally agreed that it's not needed for the argument, which is presumably why proponents, including Ben and Fazer, don't include it. As I was saying, it's needed in the argument for the justification of a premise. I'm not sure whoever said that it's generally agreed that it's not needed for the argument, as he claims. Given this, I'll keep my thoughts brief. Some see Aquinas as simply describing the law of non-contradiction, which states that contradictory propositions cannot both be true. But others see him as asserting that an object cannot change itself. But then the question becomes, what exactly is an object? If, for example, a steel rod that's heated on one end counts as an object, then objects can actualize or change themselves, because if the rod was left alone, the hot end would warm up the cold end. Hence, this is a false premise. But again, Ben and Fazer don't employ it, so I'll move on. This is what happens when you don't carefully read arguments. Let's go back and read. Now, it is not possible that the same thing should be at once in actuality and potentiality in the same respect, but only in different respects. For what is actually hot cannot simultaneously be potentially cold. It is therefore impossible that in the same respect and in the same way, a thing should be both mover and moved, i.e. that it should move itself. Therefore, whatever is in motion must be put in motion by another. Yes, something can be mover and moved in different respects, but in the very example, these are not in the same respect, rather in different respects. One end of the rod, changing another end of the rod. 
This doesn't contradict the premise. The premise says, in the same respect and in the same way. Yes, it's absolutely true that in composite being, being which has parts, you can have different parts changing another part, but this doesn't contradict that premise. Again, this is why it's important to carefully read the arguments. For when you read the argument carefully, and you understand the terms involved, and think about what change involves, the actualization of a potential, you'll see that it's absolute nonsense to have something be both mover and moved, or changer and changed, or actualizing and actualized in the very same way and in the same respect. And this is founded on the impossibility of something both being and not being in the same way in the same respect. Premise 4. But this cannot go on to infinity because then there would be no first mover and, consequently, no other mover, seeing that subsequent movers move only in as much as they are put in motion by the first mover, as the staff moves only because it is put in motion by the hand. If you don't want an infinite, infinite regress of causes, if you don't want an infinite regress of things that have actuality and potential, and then something has to actualize it, and something has to actualize it, and something has to actualize it, you have to come to the unactualized actualizer. We would have a vicious regress if there weren't something at the bottom level, you might say. Yes, if we don't want an infinite regress, it seems, given what we know, that we must assume an unactualized actualizer, or a first cause, or an unmoved mover, or a non-contingent contingency. But that's definitely not sufficient reason to conclude that there is one. In fact, that's simply an argument by assertion. And in Ben's case, it's also an appeal to emotion. If you don't want an infinite, infinite regress of causes, you have to come to the unactualized actualizer. To quote Ben, Facts don't care about your feelings. And I don't care about what we want, I care about what's true. Now, unlike Ben and Phaser, Aquinas does provide an argument. That being that if the deterministic chain were to go on forever, there would be no first mover and consequently no other mover. But this simply doesn't stand to reason, and this is primarily because it's based on outdated and flawed Aristotelian physics. It's not true to say that Phaser simply asserts it. It may seem that way if you haven't read the text. Phaser talks about this on pages 20 through 25 in the Aristotelian Proof chapter. He goes through this extensively, why a concurrent series of actualizers and things actualized ordered in these hierarchical series cannot regress indefinitely or infinitely. It's not true to say he simply asserts it. When you read the premise, you must also read the justification for the premise, which appears in the text. Although he links the text in the description box, it seems he has not bothered to read it. This goes back to what I was saying about people asking for an argument but never bothering to listen, or never bothering to actually read. And yes, if the premises of the argument are true, and if the reasoning is valid, then yes, we do have sufficient reason to conclude that there is an unactualized actualizer. And to deny the conclusion would be contrary to reason. He has given no example whatsoever of how this relies upon outdated Aristotelian physics, and he has given no demonstration that it does rely upon Aristotelian physics. In reality, the argument relies upon a metaphysical analysis of change, which Aristotle does perform, but it does not rely upon any sort of outdated physics. If there is no first mover, which is to say, if cause and effect is infinite, we have an answer that accurately accounts for our observations, and, most critically, one that doesn't require us to make an unfounded assumption that violates everything we know. Or to put this all another way, given all the evidence we have for movers absolutely requiring a mover, do we have sufficient reason to believe that there's a mover that doesn't require a mover? No. As weird as it might seem, as unintuitive as it might seem, the evidence indicates that everything is contingent on something, and this is further bolstered by the fact that the law of conservation of energy has never been violated, even by quantum mechanics. No, it's actually an infinite series and a hierarchical series which is utterly contrary to experience, for in that case, change would be impossible. Imagine this situation. Imagine you try to power your laptop by plugging it into a power strip. And then you try to power the power strip by plugging that into another power strip. And then you plug in the power strip to yet another power strip. Is your laptop going to be powered? Suppose someone suggested, yeah, but how about I do this infinitely many times? I plug in a power strip into another one, into another one, infinitely many times. Then I can power my laptop. Now, if you think that such a suggestion would be a little bit ridiculous, then think about what you're saying when you propose an infinite regress. For if there is no power, if you will, then there can be no power to actualize. And if nothing can actualize, nothing can be actualized. And if nothing can be actualized, then nothing can change. And that is utterly contrary to experience. Speaking of evidence, there's plenty of evidence that things change, I assure you. And the gentleman in this video also agrees with me. Instead of thinking of a ladder-like chain of events, think of a long circular chain of events, one in which every cog is turned by another cog, 
and hence there being no need for a cog that turns itself. Actually, the cog wheel example is very unfortunate for him, because cogs have the sort of secondary causal power that Phaser describes, in that they must be turned by another. They can't just suddenly turn themselves. And so what he's proposing here is an infinite series of cogs, each cog turning another, and only being able to turn insofar as it itself is turned, and expecting any of the cogs to be able to move, if we have one of these hypothetical infinite series of cogs. Just like I was proposing an infinite series of power strips plugged into yet another power strip, somehow being able to power a laptop. Now just in case you're thinking, what about the Big Bang? Doesn't that prove an absolute beginning? The answer is definitely no. I won't explain why here, as it would take too long, but I'll leave a link below to a video in which I do. And as Phaser already explained, the sort of actualization that we're talking about in the Aristotelian argument, and in the argument from motion or change, is here and now actualization, not just in the distant past. And because the argument is not about something happening in the distant past, considerations of the Big Bang and any sort of cosmological speculation are irrelevant to the argument. They do not show up as a premise in the argument, and are therefore irrelevant. This is a red herring. The argument is about the present, not about the distant past. And finally, here's Aquinas' conclusion. Therefore, it is necessary to arrive at a first mover, put in motion by no other, and everyone understands this to be God. You have to come to the unactualized actualizer, right? A thing that just is, right? A thing that just exists. And as Aquinas says, this is what we call God. Do you know how New Ages label inanimate, unconscious, mysterious things God? Well, it seems that Aquinas beat them to it. Now, to his credit, Aquinas didn't propose that this argument proves the existence of his very specific Christian God. For that, he offered additional flawed arguments. Well, if you read on at the Prima Paris of the Summa Theologiae, you'll see it's incorrect to think of God as a specific sort of something, like a man, a dog, and a cat, or a specific sort of animal. There can't be a specific sort of unactualized actualizer, or a specific kind of subsistent existence. It just makes no sense. But my point being here is that even if this argument was valid and sound, even if it proved the existence of an unmoved mover or an unactualized actualizer, that's literally all it would prove. It wouldn't prove that there's only one unactualized actualizer, that it still exists, or that it's conscious. And it definitely wouldn't prove that it inspired a 600-year-old man to build a boat in order to survive a worldwide flood, etc. Yeah. I mean, that's all the argument is intended to show at that point. The other stuff is developed later on in the prima pars of the Summa Theologiae. Just check out the table of contents to see how the thing is outlined. He takes what he establishes previously and builds upon it. But given the thesis of the gentleman's video is that the unactualized actualizer is debunked, that's not something you'd want to concede to me, is it? Now, to be fair, Ben evidently offers additional arguments as to why he attributes such qualities to this unactualized actualizer, and Phaser spends premises 19 to 49 doing the same. But these are, really, additional arguments, and so I'm going to tackle them in a subsequent video. So, to recap, the objections I've brought up in this video are as follows. Premise 2 commits a black swan fallacy, since it's based on incomplete knowledge. Premise 3 either states the law of non-contradiction, or it's simply a false premise. Premise 4 is an argument by assertion, and in Ben's case, it's also an appeal to emotion fallacy. And the conclusion is a special pleading of the second premise. If you think the conclusion of the argument is a special pleading of that premise, then you, you haven't understood what that premise is. The premise is, whatever is moved, is moved by another. But something which is unmoved, is not moved, obviously. And because we're not talking about something that is moved, we're not asking for a special exception to the premise. And so the charge of special pleading makes no sense. What's more, even if the argument was sound, all it would prove is an unactualized actualizer, and that's literally it. Anyhow, thank you kindly for the view, and I want to remind you that you're going to die. Well, that's it for this video. If you want to learn more about the Aristotelian proof, you want to see the full argument and understand it, check out Phaser's book, Five Proofs of the Existence of God, and also his book entitled Aquinas both of which I'll link in the description box below. Thanks for watching.